Yes, this is supposedly an energy conference, so, uh, but I, most of our work's in multi uh, mineral processing, but we do a lot of work in energy, chemical, petrochemical areas because there's really so much overlap and you can see that from this type of talks in multi-phase, multi-physics, reaction engineering, small micro-scale behaviour having a big influence on how large-scale processes operate and really talking when they're in industry systems, they're large industrial vessels that are uh, quite hard to operate, often linked with a whole lot of other units. And the industry, at least in mineral processing, is very conservative because you have to stump up a huge amount of money, similar to the power industry, as Sean mentioned earlier, you might be spending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to produce a plant and you need to be able to run that for a number of decades to get the money back. There's a few differences, as I see it anyway, in that a lot of the feeds for mineral processing systems are, are quite different in that you might find a, a copper or a pyrite or here or here or here and it could just be in Chile or in Australia and each one of those will be different. They might have more or less arsenic or <laughs> other parts, so there's a number of different process steps and some of the details of the unit processes can be quite different. Also the run of mine, so that what you dig up today can vary quite significantly to what you might be digging up in a year. So that the flow sheets, while possibly conceptually similar, products are going in, the flow sheets can be quite different and I guess the technology develops over time as well <coughs> and it's never quite clear as to what flow sheet would be used. So I'm going to talk about three examples of some of the work we've done today. And I guess our research philosophy that we try to use when we have problems and people who are prepared to put in enough money is to do small scale laboratory experiments where we can do PIV or some other visualisation technique on a small part that captures the key physics such as the interplay <coughs> of bubbles and particles and the effect of turbulence. Try and capture that in a simple model so that we have some confidence that the turbulence and the interaction terms work correctly. Put that into a larger model possibly with reactions and everything on the full scale and then perhaps use some site measurements. Um, you could say validation but at least to establish a level of confidence. First thing I want to talk about is a coal beneficiation fluidized bed. So this is some work we had a Chinese student work with us. The problem is that you have coal particles of, <coughs> some, of an order of millimetres varying density, some are sand, so they're about 2600 metres cubed versus about 1200 metres cubed for coal particles. One way of separating them is put them into a medium of magnetite which has a density of about 4000 metres cubed, fluidise that with air, you can then float off the coal particles or the light particles versus the denser particles will separate out. So how to formulate that? Well there's a number of different numerical schemes that have advantages and disadvantages. We decided to use a two fluid model for the dense magnetite phase so that we have gas bubbles, magnetite particles and then couple in a DEM model and develop what we call a hybrid model in the MFIX framework. This just shows an example of sort of three, three different conditions for different sized coal particles. The colour represents the density so the red ones are basically sand, the blue ones are the coal and in this case here with the large particles you can see you get some degree of separation. The small particles you get almost no segregation. And then, then you can look at well what effect do the operating parameters have. There was some experimental work done in China where they compared the uh, distribution of the gang material up the bed. We could then sort of reproduce that in the model Similarly, you can see in this case, you float, float the coal particles off and you can get that, we can predict that separation. Whereas in this case here, you don't get the separation. So that gave us a level of confidence in the model. This is just operating at different UMFs. So that you can see that if you fluidize the bed fairly effectively, you get quite good mixing. If you drop the fluidization down, you get the separation. So again, you can see the models producing something interesting. 
and you can then plot, because we're using a DEM approach, you can have particles of different size and different density and you can look at how the separation goes. Next area we'll talk about is flotation cells. Froth flotation is a technology used for uh, separating two, two materials. This is a slurry coming in of, say, sand and chocolate pyrite. You inject air, you produce air bubbles. The, you adjust the, sur the surface chemistry so that the chocolate pyrite is hydrophobic and attaches to the bubbles. The sand particles, say in this case, should then just stay in the slurry and flow out. The particles and bubbles rise to the top, form a froth, and you can take it off. And so that you then upgrade from, say, half a percent or one percent chocolate pyrite to maybe 10 or 20 percent chocolate pyrite in the feed, so you produce less material. We've had a long program where we have a one metre cube, or basically one metre cell. We've been able to do detailed single phase PIV measurements, compare those to CFD predictions. For single phase, we sort of capture the key recirculation flow and so on. So sort of single phase gives us a level of confidence. We can then put air into the cell, predict air distributions. We have some optical techniques where we uh, suck out or draw out uh, a mixture of bubbles and water, in this case, some optical techniques. You can then do a size distribution on the bubbles. We've got a fairly simple five-class music model with uh, breakup and coalescence, turbulence model interactions. We can sort of get a reasonable idea of the size distribution. We'll say a bit more about that a bit later on. Uh, we've also got voidage probes so that we can then get voidage distributions up the cell and again you can see the model gives reasonable predictions. These are at different positions but the black lines, the one we're trying to match. On top of that we then add some, a model to understand what happens to the particles because this is a bubble. You have small particles so the bubble might be say 800 microns in diameter. Particles might be 50 microns. So the particle interacts with the bubble and attaches somehow. So we use a uh, zero order moment number density equation with uh, attachment and breakup terms. These are essentially based on uh, fluctuating turbulent components. But then there's a probability of the particle actually coming in contact with the bubble, probability of adhe adhesing in that the particle may come in, slide around and then fall off. Then there's a, it's a stability in that the interaction across the, across the interface, will the particle, is the particle hydrophobic, will it attach to the bubble, is the uh, interaction forces between the two objects sufficient to allow it to stay attached or is it going to be broken off. And so that's based on the bond number which comes down to contact angle and surface tension. If we put that into, into a model, we can look at what the attachment rate is, where the particles are attaching to the bubbles, how loaded they are so that we, as part of the number density approach, we track the number of particles attached to each bubble because there's obviously a limit in that if you have a bubble here with a number of particles attaching off it, there's only a certain amount of area, surface area of the bubble the particles can attach to. And we can look at particle distribution so that the <coughs> solid feed comes in here with fresh particles and we have the tails going out here with uh, with the other particles and hopefully froth floated off at the top. And we can look at what's attached to the bubbles, where they're rising up. I indicated there's some challenges and I guess that's part of the aim of this workshop. Improving bubble particle interaction and we've done various amounts of work, at least from a physical sense. I guess there's also a number of numerical approaches that could be used to improve how that works. The prediction of bubble size and I guess the problem we had from Roberto the other day <laughs> in, in that in, a, in, in our cell we can put in water and air and generate bubbles with the impeller in the cell, get the break up and as you can see we can get reasonably good agreement with even a fairly simple population balance model. Uh, to make these particles because you want to make the bubbles, you want to keep the, the bubbles small 
because that increases your surface area, reduces your rise velocity, so it improves your flotation performance. So they put in something called a frother, and that then prevents coalescence. So that the approach so far is that we've put that in, we've added that, adjusted fairly ad hoc the breakup coalescence terms. We can then match the size distribution that we measure, so that's not so good. But I guess some of the work Danielle presented yesterday where he's talking about being able to look at the actual interface chemistry and uh, have a more predictive model is a fairly interesting idea. What limits bubble loading? Attachment and detachment's a question. Sort of the holy grail of flotation is coarse particle flotation in that huge amount of energy in the mining industry goes into taking big rocks and smashing them down to 50 microns so that you can see what the material is. If you only smash them down to say one millimetre rocks, you'd save a huge amount of energy. But then how do you float those off because you don't want to put all of that through your uh, concentrator. The froth model. Um, there are froth models by Jan Silius and others where they look at the plateau borders and the details by putting that into even a little laboratory cell, a little uh, line of full scale cells. So some way to understand that. And I guess what we want to know is what's the thickness of the froth layer um, and the particle motion. This is what a froth looks like off the top of a flotation cell. <laughs> So you can see these are bubbles of order <coughs> 1 to 10 millimetres, say. You can sort of see a few dots here. These are the particles that are attached. So these are sitting on the top and then they flow off. So how do they flow off? Because designing the equipment that takes the froth off, to get the froth off efficiently, stop these particles draining back. You're OK if the liquid drains back, but you certainly don't want the particles draining back. So that's certainly a huge challenge to understand that. Some of the work we've been doing on trying to understand bubble particle interaction, we have a rig where we have a, put a basically one millimetre bubble on the end of a tube, we drop a <laughs> drop, um, number of particles down onto the tube. And let's see if we can make that work again. So, uh, no. Uh, uh, uh. So you can see the particles come down, they interact with the bubble, some go in front of the bubble, some go behind the bubble, some slide around. How far they slide around is, and sort of this probability of whether they're going to touch the bubbles is a fairly um, important thing. Uh -oh. Coarse particle flotation. This is a really interesting device that's been developed recently. You put the slurry in at the bottom, the particles sort of settle down, so you have, shall I say, a packed bed. Then you have an aeration device here where you inject air in, you produce bubbles, the bubbles form, or air and water, so you have air and water flowing up through there, so you end up with basic what they call a teeter bed or a fluidized bed fluidized by the liquid coming in and the bubbles go in through the particles, hopefully the particles then attach and then at the top you have more like a flotation cell where you have the bubbles going up and a froth coming out. So we sort of have a whole lot of problems that are being discussed by... <laughs> We've done some fairly preliminary modelling, so we have this packed bed here where... and then we have this fluidized bed with liquid and even just doing the two-phase system and trying to get the bed height, nothing seems to match. <laughs> so we sort of did some experiments and adjusted the drag coefficient to, to at least match the bed height, as I think Ray was talking about yesterday, using the practical approach of, well, this is what happens in the real world. We'll do some scaling to bring that back. We inject some air in and we can, we can predict something, but really what are the interaction terms between a bubble of say 500 microns going up through a bed of particles. Uh, there's a lot of development work there. We also do some work in metal production and aluminium electrolysis is an area we've done a lot of work in a few years ago. This is basically turning electric electricity from coal 
or hydro perhaps into frozen aluminium in that if you take a typical coke can you need about 11 laptop batteries to reduce the al alumina this is just the alumina not the producing the alumina from the bauxite in, into metal operates at about 960 degrees the currents and magnetic fields are um, huge so this is a typical cell and you have pot lines of you know, over 100, all these little units connected together. They're about 3 metres by uh, 10 or 12 metres long. You put in 150, 600,000 amps through these bus bar circuits. You have uh, alumina dissolved in this cryolite melt, so it's aluminium oxide. You put the, the current through the the alumina dissociates, the oxygen reacts with the carbon anodes and produces CO2. The aluminium goes down and produces metal down the bottom. And you this is all happens in a gap of about 40 millimetres, give or take. And then you have a molten layer of aluminium underneath. The anodes, since they're carbon and reacting with the oxygen, get consumed, so they move down into the bath. I'll try not to explain any too much of this. <laughs> oh, I, I could if you... Fun? So we have electric field, generating magnetic currents, generating magnetic field. We have a two-phase flow, or three-phase flow if you like, if you consider the particles as Lorentz force driving that. You also have thermal effects because they actually the cryolite's so corrosive to stop the cells being eaten away, they freeze a layer of bath around the outside. So there's a very thermal balance. There's also stress fields. We ignore this bit and this bit, partly because the cell designers have, if they can't do this bit, they can't even start up. So they have pretty good models, finite element models for looking at heat transfer, looking at the different refractories to go into that. Uh, so what we did was sort of bring all of this together in a multi-sponsor project. That was partly done through um, IFA and uh, Sintef in Norway and CSIRO in Australia. So they developed an electromagnetic model. So these are the bus bars carrying 600,000 amps into the cell. They then go through the anodes. Here you can see a VOF surface, so they put the anodes in, move the anodes up and down based on, and they have a VOF surface for the metal cryolite bath. They calculate the distortion of that interface based on the electromagnetic fields only, primarily, and they move the anodes up and down so that you have a constant uh, resistance, essentially, between the, across the bath. We then use that interface and surface velocity as a boundary condition into our model. The magnetic fields are calculated separately because that's a whole separate thing and that really the magnetic fields generated in the cell itself is not important. It's what's generated by all these bus bars. So we just import that magnetic field, put in some physics for the flow and we can generate the flow. And so that's essentially a steady state bath flow. But into that they drop alumina particles that then get mixed and dispersed as you can see here, it's fed in here, and that, that happens over about a, about a one-day period of what they call the anode rotor, because the, as the anodes get worn down, they take them out of this point and move them around in the cell to try and... Uh, well, not move them around in the cell, but they take, take the old ones out that are being consumed and put in new, new anodes. And the feeding process being transient, we have to take this steady-state flow and then impose just a... Um, an alumina transport transient model over that steady state flow with reactions in so that we can look at uh, where the alumina has been consumed. Sort of the approach we've used was to develop a bubbly flow model of the flow under the electrode, use that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, to input into the, um, into the CFD simulation of the full cell. Obviously, Sort of that's one path. We've also been doing some micro scale modelling of bubbles on the bottom of anodes to try and understand the drag so that we can um, improve that. Because I guess what we get from this model 
is an understanding. So this is a picture of a, a model. We have air sparged through a porous uh, interface on the bottom of the anodes. This is about half a metre wide and about a metre and a bit long. We have three anodes there and a bath of water about so deep. By doing PIV on, on the, the flows there, we can look at what the velocity fields are and the gas distribution then through a fairly laborious process of changing the drag model coefficients and bubble induced turbulence we can then come up with something that from the CFD model that represents the flow in the bath because I don't think there's much correlations in the literature for that type of problem. What we've been doing with the resolved bubble model to try and understand that is what we, the bath experiments basically air and water whereas the industrial applications are cryolite and CO2. If you take the normal parameters, viscosity, surface tension, density, do a dimensional analysis, both of those come out looking pretty good and so you'd say well you should get agreement between the bubbles but as you can see these two don't quite match. If you look more closely you'll notice the contact angle varies if you match the contact angle for water case you can kind of reproduce the same behaviour. The other thing we looked at was and this is a little bit more recently is the effect of the magnetic field in that we, if we induce a bubble here it'll propagate along our anode and go up through the surface channel. But what we have is a magnetic field operating horizontally or in this plane here, say, we have a current coming through, this, through, through the board, so that gives us a Lorenz force. And in this case, it's acting in that direction, but it actually makes the bubbles go faster. If we have it in the reverse direction, the bubbles tend to go slower. And if we change the orientation of our magnetic field so that the force is now acting crossways across the anode, we can make the bubbles go sideways and while you say the bubbles are moving opposite to the field you've got to remember the force actually actually acts on the liquid so it's the liquid that's being moved rather than the bubbles and the bubbles are just <coughs> tracking through the liquid field. How we use this was a little bit still to be determined but so this is a simulation of the full cell we have some anodes here which have slots so these are vertical slots so the bubbles can escape quickly and some of these anodes the slots have been eaten away as the, as the anode's been consumed and you can see here that uh, the anodes with no slots have a different flow behaviour which is, is what happens and because we're in this model we're solving, we're generating the gas based on the current density in the base of the anode, you get different gas generation under different anodes and because of that lack of sweeping and clearing of the bubbles you end up with gas voids under some of these anodes which then reduce the current flow through those anodes. Then, so that gives us our steady state bath and gas flow distribution, our current distribution. Then with the current distribution we can feed in the alumina cycle, so this is a transient simulation with feeding at these red points and this varies over time. They have a strategic pro process of increasing and decreasing the alumina concentration in the bath because that has an effect on voltage and that gives them a control because if you, they need to operate these cells in a fairly narrow alumina concentration otherwise the performance of the cell and the operation of the cell deviates. So by varying the concentrations by using this cyclic feeding process of where they drop the alumina concentration down and then raise it up, they can control the cells and they know where they're op what range they're operating in. And from the simulations you can see that in this case you get a sort of depleted alumina region here that develops over time and I think up in this, these areas here you get an increase in alumina concentration. So this is interesting for our um, industrial collaborators. I guess the original model here was just a single species equation and we then extended that with some 
some funding to look at sort of a multi-step reaction because alumina doesn't just turn to aluminium, it breaks down into a large number of subspecies. So we developed a six species model for trying to predict that. So it's in conclusion, sort of presented some examples of multi-scale, multi-physics type work that we've been doing. And I guess the areas sort of, sort of see needs for improvement, sort of sub-models, understanding how to develop those, what they should be. And I guess the important thing is that they scale in that if you, do, if you develop your sub-model and you can operate it on, say, a one metre device, if you then extend that to a 20 or 50 metre device, do those sub-models still, still work and capture the right, the right physics? without having to resolve down to 10 particle diameters or whatever you need for a fluidized bed. And I suppose this, this partly comes back to the sub-models in that if we do these resolved models, how do we then take those to uh, larger scale sub-models that can then be implemented in large scale codes? And we've done some work on looking at the, shape, the bubbles, we can calculate the drag, but it's then sort of an ad hoc process to get to a term that you can put into a two fluid type model. And I guess everyone wants faster solvers, but speed is, is one, one area, but also convergence in the, the number of iterations or the size of the time step you have to use to be able to get to that solution. Just put up an ad for anyone who wants to come to Australia. We're running a conference at the end of the year along with Abing U in particle technology and CFD in sort of this type of area. And just acknowledge my um, collaborators who have done most of the work in the presentation. Thank you. Time for a few questions.